let's uh, let's open with prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice. Uh, say with you, Lord, that you have made everything, and we uh, thank you and recognize you and your creative power, and we rejoice uh, in being a part of your creation, uh, whom you have redeemed uh, through the blood of your Son Jesus Christ, our Lord. In His name, we pray. Amen. All right. So, uh, did everybody get a handout? Uh, or everybody got one to share? They're over there. Uh, in front of Pastor Ware. If we need more, we can uh, we can recreate some more. Uh, Thank you. Pastor Show shamed me about it inadvertently. He asked about my. Uh, my last presentation on uh, predestination, and I had absolutely nothing to give him because I just worked off the annotations I made in my book of Concord. So, <laughs> so I had took pictures of my book of Concord and texted them to him. And so, so with this uh, with this presentation, I thought maybe I needed to have something to show for it at least. So, so here you go. Uh, this is uh, central and uh, foundational in understanding the body and who we are, what the world is. Uh, every little kid learns the, the six days of creation, uh, the different things that are made on each day. Uh, 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 this is, uh, if you don't have this, you're not going to have anything else. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like building your house on the sand. Uh, it's going to wash away. Uh, sadly, I just thought about it on the way over here that it wasn't that long ago there was that article was published in the uh, Concordia Journal where a, uh, a professor from my alma mater at Seward had said you could, you didn't have to hold to the uh, biblical view of creation in order to be a confessional Lutheranism, and that was quite a stink. Do you remember that? No. You're better off then. <laughs> but anyhow, so here we have this is what we're going to consider for this morning. Uh, so I uh, begin there with a quotation from Kleinig. Uh, we cannot appreciate the complexity, beauty, and mystery that the human body of the human there should, probably should be enough there of the human body unless we realize that it is given to us. We do not make bodies. They are made for us, they are provided for us with all their main characteristics. We receive them as a gift, but from whom or what? All right, and this is uh, the focus for today. And then there is a uh, citation there uh, from Gerhard's Commonplaces that the two principal works of God... Uh, he says, Scripture bears witness that in time God performed two especially great works to which all the rest can be related in a certain order and manner, namely, the creation of the entire universe and the restoration of the human race. From this we conclude that God made a decree about both from eternity. The nature of this decree is shown by its execution. So if you don't understand creation, if you reject the first, uh, you know, two or five chapters of Genesis, then you're already uh, limiting half of God's work. You're, you're cutting God in half, essentially, uh, if, if you don't have an understanding uh, of this doctrine of creation. And here, uh, he defines uh, creation, and here it is, our intent to discuss creation, which is the first work in which God revealed himself externally as he came forth from his hidden throne, so that God, who by nature is invisible, could be known by visible things, right, concrete things. Uh, he did a work that by its visibility revealed himself as the workman, writes Ambrose. Consequently, Basil also says this entire world, like a written book, implies the glory of God. Right? So this is uh, central for our understanding that we are creatures and God is our creator. Uh, that this is central and must be understood above anything else. We must always start in the beginning, as Genesis says, 
to introduce who we are as humans and the importance of the human body. Uh, in the, and the importance of the human body, we must consider our source. Where did we come from? Right? Uh, where something comes from makes it significant. Uh, when my child brings me a drawing that I can't quite tell what it is, uh, it has no value in and of itself, but because it came from my daughter, whom I love, uh, I keep it and file it away. Right? Otherwise, you throw it away and you're a, a horrible person. Right? Do you get those drawings, Pastor Yeager? Or your, your children are artistic. Mine are very artistic. Because they created it, it makes it important. Uh, that this is important to understand for us where we come from, who made us. Uh, so let's, uh, before we go any further really, let's, let's read uh, Genesis 1, uh, that I think this is significant, that there's some of these uh, passages of Scripture that we're so familiar with uh, that we sometimes forget exactly what they do or don't say. Uh, that you hear, like Luke 2 so much, you know, you, you think you know it, uh, but then some, you go and read it and you realize there is something there that you never noticed before. Uh, the same with uh, Genesis and the account of creation. Uh, we hear it so much you, from the time you're little in your story Bible uh, and on after that. Uh, so, uh, who would like to begin... Uh, and help uh, save my voice. There you go. Pastor Berger, have at it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind, with seed in them. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning a third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for season and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. So God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and also the stars. And God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on earth, and to rule the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning a fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the expanse of the heavens. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. 
Then God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing of the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, so that they will have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has the fruit of the tree yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky, and to everything that creeps on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. That's, Thus, good, enough. That's good enough, Pastor Berger. We'll, t we'll take that for now. We've got to chew on it a little bit. Take a bite at a time. Thank you. You should uh, you should look into like doing audio books or something. <laughs> yeah. if, the, if the whole preaching thing falls through, you could have a backup. Yeah. Uh, or uh, I'm a man of brevity, so I'm a big fan of John one, uh, two through three. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. <laughs> I love John 1. Uh, but Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 point to the creation of the universe, and especially the penultimate creation, the creation of man and woman, as the central culminating aspect of the creation of the universe. Everything else was good, right? After each of the first... Five days it was good, but after the sixth day it was yeah, very go. good. Right? That everything was finally the way it was supposed to be. Throughout the first five days of creation, God creates and orders everything, and the culmination of creation was the creation of man. Kleinick says, but when he has made Adam and Eve and housed them in their proper habitat, he is even more pleased. He recognizes that they, together with the whole physical life support system for them, are very good, excellent, perfect, and utterly splendid. Uh, that uh, this is all what uh, what the creation account is working up toward is the creation of man, uh, and it's not just because we are uh, self-centered. Uh, but actually, this is the most significant thing God has done. Uh, and so we are more important than birds and animals and all these other things. Uh, so when understood within the proper order that God is an orderly God, uh, and we understand how this is all working toward this occasion of creating man and woman, then we understand and recognize uh, how all of these things are supposed to work together. Uh, so also, uh, every catechumen learns this uh, when they learn uh, the first article of the creed. 
Uh, let's recite it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And what does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures. He has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Right, and, uh, in his uh, Catechism on Human Life, uh, Professor John Pless writes, God has made me and all <coughs> creatures, so reads the Catechism's explanation of the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Luther does not argue for the truthfulness of Genesis 1 and 2, <coughs> but assumes it and moves on to make the point that God is my maker. The biblical account of creation excludes three popular alternatives. Uh, first, materialism claims that the universe is a product of uh, evolutionary chance. Pantheism sees the universe as permeated by divine energy. Deism uh, accepts a creator but denies that God actively governs and sustains his handiwork. Over against these false views of creation stands the truth that God, the Father Almighty, is the maker of heaven and earth. To be a creature is to be dependent on the Creator for all of life. Uh, that this is uh, not simply the case that God uh, sets things in motion or uh, tips the first domino into going, but He continues uh, to kick the dominoes on down the line. Okay. Uh, that God causes everything to come into being uh, and continues to care for it uh, and care for us throughout our life. Thus, without recognizing our relationship to God as creator, then we attempt to make ourselves God. Right? If God wasn't our creator, if we just happen to come into being like any of these other alternative theories uh, try to assert, uh, then we are our own God, we are the most important, uh, we are it, uh, the buck stops here with us, and then uh, we are the ones who decide the rules and do whatever we want. <coughs> right, this is why uh, creation uh, is attacked so vehemently. If we are created creatures, then that means we answer to somebody. If we're not created creatures, if we just happen by chance, then we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, and then it's anarchy. Okay? Uh, but if we are created creatures, then there is a creator, and uh, we are responsible to someone, whoever it may be. Yes, we, Pastor? Yeah, if we hold to a false creation, then what, what follows is then is a false Anthropology. The whole deal. Yeah. And therefore goes out total depravity. Exactly. Yeah. It, I mean, it's everything uh, pivots off of this. Everything stems from this. It's, I mean, then uh, it's, uh, it's just like uh, at the beginning that these are the two principal works of God is uh, creation and restoration. And if he didn't create, then he doesn't have any care and restore it. Yes. In the creation myths of the ancient Near East, everything starts with chaos. Yeah. And then, <coughs> when you come to the creation myth of the Old Testament, everything starts with God, and He knows that there's chaos, but then creates it into something good. And then you have creation myths in other parts of the world, like in like with the Aztecs, where there's like five different creations and everything and always ends in chaos and yet also at the same time you also have um, these gods that are demanding people serve them and yet 
God creates us so that he serves us, too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know a lot about the Aztecs, so I can't comment too much on that. But, yeah. <laughs> I know they had good tans, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I, I mean, it's... What... Well, I think, well, if I remember, there was a quote that uh, Reed had uh, to give us an Argo plug. There was a quote that Reed had in his... Uh, please turn off all cellular devices. Uh, and, no recording without express written consent from the uh, National Football I'm League. Right. Mia uh, culpa. Mia culpa. <laughs> You're forgiven. Praise the Lord. Uh, but Reed, Reed had a comment in his uh, Losi presentation that the most important thing about, something to the extent that the most important thing about you is what you believe about God. Right? That, that defines who you are. Uh, even if you don't believe in any God at all. That it all comes back to, to who who you're uh, who is responsible for you and who you're responsible to answering for. Did you have something, Pastor Ware? I think that's an important point she made about <coughs> if, if everything is chaos and, ran, and randomness. Yes. Right. That there's no uh, then there's then it's also purposeless. Yeah. So my my being just gets depressing as, as a human being. As, there's no purpose. Yeah. Uh, in my existence. It's by accident. Nobody cares about you. Nobody loves you. Uh, and you're just wandering around doing whatever you want. And then you end up like, was it Sartre that was all uh, just uh, seeking after pleasure and nothing has any real, real reason or purpose. <coughs> right? um, don't do that. And then you just, you get either really depressed or... Uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, really depressed either way, just depending on what track you take. It's sort of like the uh, the the youngest son uh, in our gospel lesson, right? That he's just seeking after himself. He denies his father, who is his creator, uh, and uh, goes and squanders it all with uh, prostitutes and reckless living, right? Which uh, only gets you so far. Yeah, Pastor Berger. Yeah, that um, I think that this is also because that way of thinking, a godless way of thinking, which has really permeated the entire education system of the United States. Most um, everything in general. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but what it, what it does is that nihilism le leads, leads people to seek meaning. And if you seek meaning apart from God, then you're going to want to save the world from the, 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 the sun devil that's, that's heating up the world, and so we have to all drive electric cars. That kind of a thing. And because it's taking your eyes off the creator himself and your own createdness. And so you have to do something really important to make yourself To important. give yourself value. As opposed to yes. nursing your, having babies and nursing them and, and cleaning the house and earning something for your family so they have a living, which is what God created you for. And yes. to help your neighbor as yourself, love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. I love babies. <coughs> well, and, and this is really important because it's the little, everyone is important. This yes. creativeness of the body means everyone's important. Uh, a person is a person no matter how small, right? <laughs> My favorite doctor. Yes, ma'am. What I get really out of Genesis 1 is man never has and never will create anything. Only God creates. Well, I mean, we can uh, make he, stuff. We can't we, create. We, uh, he allows us to participate with him in his act of creation. Um, but we can't create anything. Well, we don't create out of nothing, right? The right. way God did. Yeah, so there's, was it, there used to be a joke that went around of uh, science, what was it, how did it go? Something like a God and a scientist were debating about... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the scientist was bragging how he could create just uh -uh. as good as God did, and uh, God says, all right, well, let's see it, uh, and uh, the scientist gathers up all the dirt, and he said, no, I made that, that's mine, you've got to get your own dirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something to that effect. Yep. Yeah, right? We, we participate with him in his creation, that his creation, uh, that it doesn't, creation does not just stop with Genesis, as we'll hopefully talk about at some point, I think, uh, that it doesn't just 
stop with Genesis, but his, his act of creation continues uh, and even still today, right? The babies are born, uh, and trees grow, uh, and all the other things, but right? Who made the tree? God, right? That's what I'm That's saying, what I'm saying, that he's no, continuing man. in his creation, uh, as we confess uh, in Article 1, uh, of, uh, of the uh, creed, right, in the first article. Yeah. Just, I want to agree with the, I want to disagree with you because <coughs> okay. if you recall the original Star Trek series, oh, the, yeah. uh, the creator is Gene Rodney. It says right on the screen, right there, created by, there you go. Yeah. Shame on you. Okay. <laughs> we've got we've got the Aztecs oh and we've got God Star Trek. Let's see how far we can go. Today. We make things. We don't create a thing. Yeah. No, we don't. I created a child. Three no, you didn't. <laughs> All right. Let's keep it civil. Yes, sir. One quick thing, maybe supplementary yeah. yeah. saying in the Psalms, um, in the midst of prayer and lament. You know, the, the psalmist always brings us back to two things, the creation and the redemption. Yes. God. So though the creation is one of the primary things meant to come from us. Yes, of course. I'll get to that if we get to the end. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I get your point. All right. Uh, so, let's, uh, where was I even at? Uh, the purpose of man. Yeah. Did I read that part ahead of that? Yes, we're not we're not autonomous, and uh, auto autonomos means a self law, right? A law unto yourself uh, that then makes you you're the giver of the law. You're the one who's in charge, uh, and this is what is uh, so <coughs> applauded and encouraged today uh, amongst our young people and everybody else. You got to be autonomous. You got to be self sustaining. Uh, you shouldn't be dependent upon anybody else. Right? Uh, and uh, I, I forget, Pless quotes somebody in saying, uh, the, you're reminded that you're not autonomous by the fact that you have a belly button. Right? <laughs> that reminds you that you came from somewhere else. Oh, it's up for debate whether Adam and Eve had belly buttons. I don't know. Adam didn't. Uh, I, I said it's up for debate. I'm not getting into it with you, Marilyn. Uh, but, uh, excuse me, what, what is your, I forgot. What's your, what's your name so Fran. I can call it? Fran. Fran. Yeah. Fran. You look like somebody I knew that was named Marilyn. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yup. Just don't have on the white dress. Do it like this. Yeah. Alright. Uh, so now, uh, moving on, the eternal purpose of man. Uh, certainly man was created to live in eternity forever, uh, and I just, I've never been aware of this idea, so this was new to me, actually, uh, ironically, I just uh, had read about this before I started for this presentation, that Luther, Gerhard, and even Kleinig sort of alludes to it, uh, that they hold that Adam and Eve, uh, had they not sinned, would still at some point have been taken to God in heaven. Which what, have you all? Have you any of you pastors that you heard that before? Rappy, you had you were old enough that you talked with Gerhard about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I had vaguely heard that. I ran across it when I was reading Gerhard's sermon for Set to a uh, and then when I was pre preparing for this, Luther uh, talks about it in his uh, Genesis commentary. Um, Here's what they say. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm convinced about it, but here's what they say. Uh, Luther says, therefore, uh, the scholars put it well, even if Adam had not fallen through his sin, still after the appointed number of saints had been attained, God would have translated them from, his anim from this animal life to the spiritual life. Uh, also, a little later he says, but what is added, that man was created for his physical life in such a way that... He was nevertheless made according to the image and likeness of God, that is, an indication of another and better life than the physical. Thus Adam had a twofold life, a physical one and an immortal one, though this was not yet clearly revealed, but only in hope. 
Uh, Gerhard, in, in one of his sermons, writes, Just as Adam was not to remain forever in the earthly paradise, but instead, if he, for any length of time, had cultivated it and remained in the state of created innocence, would have been taken up into the heavenly paradise of eternal life, so also we shall not remain continuously in the labor of this newly established paradise or vineyard of the embattled church here on earth. And that's the, uh, he, that was sort of part of his introduction uh, to uh, Septuagesma, which is the gospel of the, the workers called into the vineyard at the various points of the day, if you remember from, what, a month ago, I guess. Um, uh, but all this, to me, is, is purely speculation, uh, because they did sin, they did fall, uh, so uh, you know, it's, it's like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, or whatever other kind of stuff. Uh, I, I don't know. Yes, uh, what do you think, Pastor Berger? Jump, jumping in on my presentation in May. Um, that, I know, that was like one of the difficult things, I was trying to stay in my lane. <laughs> and Irenaeus uh, is is said to say that um, it had had man not fallen into sin, Christ still would have become incarnate. And so this is Luther and Gerhard are saying the same thing Irenaeus is. Both, all of these are, are uh, hypotheticals contrary to fact. Yes. The fact is that Adam sinned, and God knew this beforehand, and had prepared a way of salvation even before he said, let there be light. Yeah. So the creation and restoration go hand in hand, and the, the resurrection is the eighth day of creation, yes. the first day of the new creation, when Jesus arose from the dead. Yeah. Bodily arose from the dead. Yes. Well, and I think with these, the interesting thing to me within our context is uh, these statements also seem to have a tinge of, of still a, uh, mm -hmm. a rejection of the physical and a uh, desire yeah. for the spiritual, uh, which doesn't sit right with me if I'm bold enough to yeah, so uh, be contrary sounding. against Luther and Gerhard. Yeah, it's a little I don't think by spiritual they mean not bodily. I think that's... Yeah, I, that's I don't know. Into that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It'd be... Uh, I think for somebody who has a lot more time on their hands than I do. I think or who... I don't know who first. He's wearing a collar, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Part of the created order. <laughs> well, I don't know if we mentioned this, but when they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it said, unless they eat of the tree of life, it lived forever. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, but that doesn't mean they'll be translated into, into heaven. Uh, I've always, at least uh, in my futile uh, mind and consideration, I just assumed that they had forever have been in Eden, and that would have been... Uh, into all eternity that he created uh, he created the earth and Eden to be eternal uh, apart from sin, right? Because without sin, and this is sort of getting into Pastor Olson's presentation for next month, but without sin there would have been no uh, nothing would have deteriorated, nothing would have been bad or harmful and you continue on forever. Uh, Just trying to put this out there, but if and since they were thrown out of the garden, and then what God intended for them to live there forever, is it possible that that's the reason why we're trying to get back to Eden? I don't know. You can talk to Pastor Olson about that next month. Okay. Uh, the uh, gentleman in the back row, did you still have a question there? No, the same point. Uh, they were prevented from eating. Yes, right? The uh, cherubs with the flame and the sword. They would have died without sin, but it ate the fire. It seems to intimate that there was not eternal life in the physical body because they were prevented from eating from that tree. But they weren't originally. But not originally. I mean, this is what we're all speculating is originally the, the original created body, which is the thing that I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> the, original, right, the original created body apart from sin as it was created uh, was, was to be constantly good and there was no deterioration, there was no death. They, they stayed the same age, right? Because we're constantly, and once you're born, you're, you're, you're on a progressing toward death, right? I'm dying, you're dying, we're all dying, right? 
uh, that we are in the process of decay. Uh, <laughs> well, you said it, not me. Uh, but uh, this is the case that we, we're in now. So we're trying to speculate about something that we uh, really cannot know and have no idea uh, and, and scarcely can comprehend. Well, I, uh, I mean, I, well, hold on, he raised his hand. <laughs> Be civil. God is orderly and in creation, there is order. He raised his hand first, then you, and then if you want to raise your hand, then maybe we can talk. <laughs> well, I, I, I do think that the, the very existence of the tree of life is, I think, the hinge that they're kind of grabbing on there yeah. uh, for that speculation. And I think, too, I think they're thinking too also in parallel with the, the state of the, we're doing a study on angels right now, this, the state of the good angels currently, right, is that they are, that they are forever now uh, un, un, incapable of falling away. Yeah. Confirmed. And I think that that, the idea, they're like confirmed in that, in that, in their, um, in their holy state. And I think that this, a lot of this language about um, spiritual life or heavenly life is not the denial of right. the physicality, but more that I think that language is pointing towards that idea of con a confirmed state of holiness without the capacity to fall away. And like Saint Paul, <coughs> flesh and spirit, when he's, that dichotomy is right. The so we'll, we will we will eventually in eternal life in our bodies in the resurrection attain the truly spiritual life without the flesh. Uh, in the resurrection. So, um, yeah. Alright, you're up. I think it's just like that going for question of like, oh, what if, would this still have happened if, you know, they didn't sin? Well, that's nonsense because God knew from the beginning. It's like when the Sadducees, I think, came to Jesus and was like, there were seven brothers and one took a wife and he died and the next brother took a wife, yeah. etc. Yeah. In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus is like, that's nonsense. Yeah. There you go. Nonsense. Hogwash! <laughs> and also, sin corrupted our means of thinking and speculating all of this correctly. Well, that's what pay I told you to talk to Pastor Olson about that next month. <laughs> all right, so, you got a hand raised? There we go. Yes, yes, Pastor, so, so, I, of course, I fully agree with the theologian that came from my loins. <laughs> and, oh. and, and I think that goes hand in hand, then, with what Pastor Ware said. And so I was just going to point to exactly what we hear in the New Testament and in Revelation, uh, as one particular about the new heavens and the new earth, which is a reflection of what things would have been without sin. Yes. I, I certainly agree with my daughter that to And that's a whole other presentation that I think somebody else is going to make, right? Isn't that, a new, isn't that another presentation about the... Uh, the uh, and the tree of life yeah, in Revelation. Stuff. Yeah, I didn't, which is the answer to I tried all. to steer clear of some of that because, like I said, I was trying to stay in my own land of this particular occasion at this time. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to do really good. And it's, okay. Are just... it's okay if you stray a little bit because I'm trying. repetition is the mother of learning. There you go. Oh, I read that somewhere. Yes. <laughs> Fran. Yes. Why are, we ar why are we arguing? This is the inspired word of For God. For fun. This is what he said. <laughs> no, this is what he said. Now, now he, already, he already has seen the story. This is a rerun. And... I, what if, what if, what if? Because we like, well, argue, yeah, this, because we like arguing and we like speculation, is, that's our humanity. It's not, All right. you know, uh, <laughs> a dancing on the head of a pin question. This, this is in the yeah. fathers, it's, it's in our theologians, right? The idea that Adam and Eve would have been confirmed in righteousness uh, and would have lived forever if they didn't fall. I mean, that's a pretty, pretty common uh, way of thinking about Genesis. Well, it's, I, I, I don't think anybody argues that they, that they would not have lived forever into eternity, but the, I think where the argument lies is where would they have lived forever in eternity, right? I, would they have lived forever in eternity there in Eden, uh, undefiled by sin, or uh, at some point, as Gerhard and Luther uh, assert, would, would they have lived, would they at, at some point have been uh, taken by God into heaven, like, I don't know, uh, like Enoch and Elijah, I don't know. Well, what is heaven? 
Uh, well, that's for another presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Berger, who's raising his hand so nicely. I think, I think with uh, Luther and Gerhard are, are, are better theologians than anyone in the room, and all of us combined. I'm offended. And so, <laughs> the, 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 um, I think that, that what Luther and Gerhard are pointing out is exactly what you're supposed to be talking about, is the eternal reality that God had in store for man, which was to be with him. In Revelation, there's a new heaven and a new earth. earth. Yes. So yep. not, and and we, we, we confessed, as we did earlier, the resurrection of the body. The body is important. So they're not denying that. They know what they're talking about. They're trying to emphasize the point that we were made for eternity. We yes. were not made to die. And we certainly, when we, if we die without Christ, it's not that we, we die eternally, and that doesn't mean annihilation. That means hell. Yeah. And that comes back to the point that you said, which was what? Restoration? Is that the word you called it? Yeah. That, well, that's what Gerhard called it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, these are the two. Everything falls into those two categories. Right? It's one or the other. Uh, everything fits into one of those two. And yet they are almost one and the same. Yeah. I mean, well, they go hand in hand, right? Uh, like hand peas hand. and carrots. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, so also then, uh, here's what Kleinick uh, said about this. He says, third, unlike every other day, there's no mention of the beginning and the end of the seventh day. Since it is God's day, it is eternal. While it is set in the time for human life on earth, it transcends all time. It belongs to eternity. It shows that the human body had been created for eternal life by resting with God in heaven rather than just for temporal life on earth with care for its plants and animals. Right. And I'm in complete agreement uh, that, uh, that humans, uh, Adam and Eve, were created for eternity uh, with that in mind. But where I would, uh, where, where I'm not totally convinced, as I said, is uh, that it was not with the intent that they would be uh, on uh, the pure, uh, un undefiled, uh, created earth into all eternity. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, I think we've debated that enough as it is. Uh, so let's uh, uh, get in at least a, a little bit into the image of God, uh, which uh, is another, I think, one of those things that's a little bit of a matter of speculation because, uh, uh, I mean, with the exception of maybe Pastor Rappy, we weren't there uh, to, uh, to see how it was. Sorry, I didn't have a while. I had to pick on somebody, so you drew the short straw. Yeah, uh, uh, it, man's creation is different than all other creation. From the start, we see that God deliberated in the creation of man. For the others, he simply spoke it. Uh, with man, he talked about it beforehand. Right? He says, "Let." He says, "Let us make." Uh, therefore, he includes an obvious deliberation and plan. He did nothing similar in the case of the earlier creatures, Luther points out. Uh, also, uh, in a uh, CTQ article from uh, Reverend Dr. Scare, uh, talking about the uh, image of God, he says, uh, thus from a literary point of view, the creation of man is the most important part of the first chapter for the following three reasons. Man's creation is introduced by uh, the different then God said, uh, alerting the reader to a different type of creative activity. Uh, two, man's creation is a result of the deliberations of God. The same is not said about previous creative acts. Uh, as the final part in the introductory material, it thus is assigned the most important position. Right. So, uh, after talking amongst himself, right, you ever talk to yourself and have conver I have conversations with myself. They're usually my most fruitful conversations. So, God was talking to himself uh, and finally he uh, uh, decides to make man in his own image. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Right? Uh, that, uh, this is made abundantly clear and this is uh, as we heard from Pastor Berger in his wonderful reading, this is distinctively different uh, than the creation of everything else. Okay? That we, uh, you know, just like your mom said, you are special, uh, you are different, uh, that uh, 
that God created man in a different way than he creates everything else in all of creation. Uh, that he thought about it, he talked about it, uh, uh, he talked about it with himself, and uh, he caused it to happen. Uh, so, we're at lunchtime, so let's, before we get any deeper uh, into this, uh, let's uh, take a break for lunch. How's that sound? So we're going to talk about something. This is kind of another one of those things that I don't know if we can really know fully uh, a whole lot about it. Uh, it. It doesn't, I'm not, I've studied on it at least the past week, which is the time I've had to put this together. Uh, and I, I really do not feel confident to, to say a whole lot about the image of God. Everybody seems to have different ideas, uh, sort of like speculating with if Adam was going to be into eternity and where was he going to be and all that other stuff we've been talking about. Uh, even Luther, uh, in his wisdom, seemed to be not entirely sure uh, in really nailing down in, in its fullness what the image of God uh, necessarily really means. Uh, he wrote, uh, I'm afraid that since the loss of this image through sin, we can't understand it to any extent. All right, so, yeah, so, uh, good night, everybody. <laughs> we'll just call it a day. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, that didn't stop Luther from speculating, just as it doesn't stop us from speculating. Uh, and so he uh, also then uh, put it this way, that he said, uh, Therefore, my understanding of the image of God is this, that Adam had it in his beginning, and that he not only knew God and believed that he was good, but that he also lived in a life that was wholly godly. That is, he was without the fear of death or of any other danger and was constant uh, and was content with God's favor. And then later he writes, Therefore, uh, that image of God was something most excellent in which we were in which we were included eternal life, everlasting freedom from fear, and everything that is good. However, through sin, this image uh, was so obscured and corrupt that we cannot grasp it, even without, even with. Uh, I think that was probably supposed to be our. It was really late when I was typing this out last night. Even with our intellect. Uh, so, uh, again, this is one of those things that's uh, sort of a matter of speculation. We had it in the beginning, and we are no longer uh, in, the same, uh, in the same with Adam because of the fall into sin that Pastor Olson is going to talk about <coughs> next month. Uh, but uh, we can speculate, but we don't really know exactly because it just says, uh, in the image of God, uh, that God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And that's, that's it. There's no further explanation. There's no, like, you know, aside where uh, the disciples ask Jesus, you know, to explain his parable, and then he, uh, you know, spells it out for them, like the parable of the sower or something like that. Uh, it just is what it is. Uh, that's the way Moses recorded it, uh, and that's what we have to go on. So... In, in its explicit use in the way that Luther uses it, it may not work quite so well to use this for the pro-life movement. Uh, unless we're looking at how that image is restored. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, and I, that's, I allotted for at the end of my presentation to talk about the effects that, the, that these understandings have with, on, uh, on current issues. Uh, but, I mean, in regards to the pro-life movement, it's not, uh, the, the image of God is not the significant thing necessarily. It's just simply that we are created uh, by God. We are creatures of God, uh, and, and that's the important thing, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are plenty of other verses we can, or passages that we can use for that. It just, it seems like, at least according to Luther here, the fact that that does often get used really doesn't work. Well, I mean, because uh, humankind has lost the image of God with the fall, we no longer have it, uh, and, and not in the same way, uh, of course, uh, and we, we don't have it uh, again, uh, at least until 
uh, until you know our baptism is finally completed in death. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean it doesn't it doesn't work so good. Plus, I mean if you're talking to a bunch of unbelievers, you're talking about somebody having the image of God doesn't exactly uh, doesn't exactly change hearts and minds. Yes. Well, just one point to that. Genesis nine actually speaks directly to that issue of life after the fall, because uh -huh. man is made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. like, so I, I've heard this pointed before that the image of God is preserved. After yeah, the yeah, and I got that. I got, it's at the end. Everything I said, all the good stuff till the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll see. I don't know. It depends how many uh, how many sidetracks we get on. We'll see. We can, you in a we hurry? Stay, we can stay longer. Yeah, the, the chili cook-off in until 4 o'clock, right? Uh, also, I thought it was sort of fun to note Luther had some interesting, uh, while we're you know thinking about things we can't really fully know for sure, uh, I thought it was interesting to throw in there that Luther and Luther uh, had some interesting ideas about Adam's abilities uh, before the fall, and I, I thought it fit in with our uh, studying of the uh, created body uh, before the fall. Uh, so here's what Luther had to say about this. He says, I am fully convinced that before Adam's sin, his eyes were so sharp and clear that they surpassed those of the lynx and eagle. He was stronger than the lions and bears, whose strength is very great, and he handled them in a way, in the way we handle puppies. Both the loveliness and the quality of the fruits he used as food were also far superior to what they are now. Also, he said, uh, I believe that Adam could command a lion with a single word, just as we give a command to a trained dog. What a wild thing to think about. Uh, like the... the before the fall, Adam was Superman. <laughs> yeah. Little leap tall buildings in a single bound. Single bound, yes. It's all the tall buildings in the garden, right? Yeah. All those things, uh, yeah. So it's interesting to consider. I mean, that's we could spend all day speculating about all the different things of what Adam and Eve would have been like uh, before the fall and how perfect everything was and. Uh, how hot Eve was and all those sorts of things. But, <laughs> but yeah, Pastor Berger, yeah, you want to you speculate on that? Women are still hot. That's not well, this is true. <laughs> oh, that's not well, and, uh, I mean, it's just true. Yes. Women, are, women are, are beautiful. And yes. God made them beautiful. Most and, definitely. Uh, why else, uh, how else would uh, we uh, be fruitful and multiply? We that's right. We're taking the, uh, the light and the... Uh, but, Yes. But I'm, and the speculation that Luther doing, I mean, C.S. Lewis does the same thing in the Space Trilogy, at least in two different worlds, where he, oh, yeah. he's looking at um, uh, what uh, different worlds would look like that were created um, by, by God. And um, in, uh, I think it's in Paralandre, uh, his, his hero is talking to the, to the woman who's there, and she has a human... Uh, body as opposed to the other world where he's been, and she says, "Well, yes, as soon as when when uh, God took on human flesh it, and Earth, then that's the only form that he would take that he would give to any other new creation." So, uh -huh. I mean, obviously, again, hypothetical, and it's just this imagination thing. But um, again, it's uh, it's interesting to see those those kinds of. Uh, hypotheticals. I don't think Luther's off in this. I think he's. I think he's right. You think about think about how you think and how you you work on a good day as opposed to a bad day. And you know there are days when everything, nothing can go wrong. You're just doing everything is is firing in your body the right way. And then yeah. there are other days you get out of bed and it's like, why did I bother to get out of bed? I should have stayed in bed. That's the way I feel most days. Yeah, I think that's the way we, most of us feel most days. Yeah. But we do have the anomaly that, that proves the difference. Sure. Schultz, uh, Della Schultz also in his uh, dogmatic, so he, he defines uh, the image of God in this way. He says, uh, in the case of the first created humans, the image of God consisted not merely of the possession of a personality with an intellect and a will, 
but in a will and an intellect that were rightly oriented toward God. The relationship between God and man was perfect, and man fully recognized God uh, doing what he desired. In other words, man lived in righteousness with God. <coughs> yeah. You know, all this it begs the question for me, I think, how, how could they disobey? It, it makes it sound like they were so good and so perfect and everything around them was so perfect. You have to roll some I think we're still. putting on a, an assumption on the word perfect. God said it was good, not perfect. Right, but it was so perfect. Uh, so, it was, it was, it was so perfect. Happened. It just makes you wonder how. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. Could have been a contender. <laughs> yeah. Why did Katie break up with me in the eighth grade? How could that possibly have happened <laughs> with the perfection that is this? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> wow. Yeah. You still, you still feel strongly about this, don't you? I made it up. <laughs> Emily can explain. Oh, sorry, back there, yes. Well, if that gets you, Lucifer did the same thing and he was in heaven. Yeah. Right, there you go. Why would you want to stay in heaven? It's all speculation. I like, uh, I'm a little partial to, uh, to Dr. Scare. Uh, I, I, he, he and I share in sort of brevity and Starkiness and sarcasm. <laughs> so he, uh, he puts it this way. He says, the image of God simply means that the object bears a resemblance to God. For example, the mirror does not have its value in itself, but in what it reflects. Man, therefore, has his worth, not because of himself, but because he in some way reflects God. The coin with Caesar's image has its value from Caesar. Uh, I kind of like... And so then... You know, that gets back to your point, Pastor Jeffers. If, if you understand the image of God in this way, uh, then, then that certainly, uh, you know, has an effect on, on the value of life uh, in its various stages. Uh, in, the, in the way that uh, money, currency, physical currency, I know this probably like, sounds wild to you kids, but dollars, <laughs> paper money, in and of itself has no value whatsoever, like a confederate dollar or anything like that. Uh, all the basis of the value of that currency is uh, that it is backed up by the government, right? That we, uh, as a collective society, have come together to agree that this little piece of paper is worth, you know, so much in goods, right? Uh, that it, and, and so the value is because uh, the government says it's so, right? And if the government's defunct, uh, then, uh, then you start, you know, wallpapering your walls with it or whatever. Right? Well, and I would say, coming back to that concept, that the, the, the question of is the value in the creation or is the value in the recreation in Christ or, you know, that which is perfect, I don't think the two have to be mutually exclusive. Yeah. Because the answer is yes. Yeah, that's why I said yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Of course it's, yeah, that's why I said it. <laughs> so then we absolutely can use it for life. Yeah, I mean, you, you can, but you got to define your terms, and you also have to recognize, I mean, with something like that, you got to recognize and, and say something that's appealing to the ones you're trying to appeal to. Right? Uh, some people may not care if you speak French or not. So... <laughs> Kleinig, uh, in his book, since that's sort of the basis of our whole uh, our whole shtick this year, uh, Kleinig point out, points out that the image of God uh, is what distinguishes man from the other creatures. He says, in simple terms, human beings are the only physical creatures made to resemble God. Right? That this is distinctively for us only uh, only Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. Uh, nothing else was made in the image of God, uh, that this is distinctive for humanity. Uh, and this also then uh, defines our humanity, that God's spoken word for human creation in Genesis 1.26, and it's 
interpretation in 127 and 51B-2 uh, tell us five things about humankind. And so then uh, here I, I give you, I like a good list. Uh, and so here's my sort of summary of these, uh, these five things that Kleinig uh, lists out uh, on page, uh, beginning on page 27 if you're following along at home. Uh, the first one is that man's nature, identity, and name come from God. Uh, that Adam names the animals, right? All the animals line up and Adam uh, names them, but then God is the one who gives Adam his name, uh, as is recorded in, uh, in Genesis 5. Right? Uh, that uh, they are the only, human, humankind is the only uh, creature that God himself names. Everything else, uh, he, he has Adam to name them. Uh, and so that differentiates, uh, that's one of the ways that uh, humanity is differentiated from the rest of creation. Also then number two, uh, in Jesus we see the fullness of the image of God. Right? And I think that's probably a presentation for one of the later months. Right, uh, the body of Christ. Uh, but, uh, sort of, spoiler alert, that's uh, where the image of God is fully revealed. Uh, so, even though God, uh, in and of himself, is a spirit and a spiritual being without a body, uh, as John 4.24 says, uh, he has designated our human bodies to manifest himself visibly and personally, just as idols, were supposed to display pagan deities and to foreshadow his incarnate son and our bodily union with him. Uh, so uh, there we see uh, the connection with uh, Jesus and how uh, God, though, uh, though in and of himself, uh, at least God the Father, is not uh, a physical being, uh, he shows his uh, physicality uh, in the creation of uh, all of these uh, physical things, especially physical man. Number two, or excuse me, number three, see who's paying attention. Number three, both male and female were created in the image of God. Both biological sex and sexual identity are given in creation and are part of the image of God. Right? As it says, in 27, God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. Right? So this is for both man and woman are, uh, were, were holders of the image of God. All of Adam, uh, number four, all of Adam and Eve were created in God's image, body and soul, or uh, spirit, depending on how you uh, fall after Pastor Ware's presentation last month. Uh, Kleinick says, the body of each person was made for theophany, uh, for God's human manifestation on earth, the visible disclosure of his glory in human terms. I really misspelled Kleinick on that one. <laughs> Spellcheck did not like Kleinick. <laughs> Add them to your dictionary. I, yeah, I should. He should have already been in my dictionary, probably. And then uh, five, uh, as part of the image of God is exercising dominion over creation. Right? And this is another distinctive uh, quality of mankind, uh, that man exercises dominion over creation. Uh, just as God exercises dominion over everything, man uh, has been set in place by God to exercise dominion over uh, God's creation. Uh, Kleinig writes, as God's vice regents, uh, they were to have dominion over all the fish and the birds and the land animals, Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Just as God maintained the whole cosmic order and supervised its proper, excuse me, proper operation, all human beings, rather than just a few powerful kings, were to maintain proper order in the animal kingdom on earth so that all animals, each in their own niche and in their own way, would thrive on earth together with all humankind. Uh, so this is also uh, distinctive for humanity. Michael. 
Yes? I think it's worth making a distinction between that which God gives Adam dominion over and which is not included. So that when we say that Adam has dominion over all creation, uh, it, it misses the mark. Okay. So that which God names, he has dominion over. And the only aspect of his creation that he delegates to Adam is the, is the naming of the animals. And so, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a segment of his creation that we have are, been given dominion over. Not, not the stars in the sky or the... Uh, sure, we have no, uh, no authority over the cosmos, right? Yeah. Because what well, there was, was it a satellite or something that was sent into space and made the whole way there and then like tipped over or something? Did I hear? Uh, that's not what I was thinking about. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, excuse it's me. A, it's a subtle point, but I think it's worth making just so that we understand that man doesn't have dominion over things that he wasn't given dominion for. Sure. Yeah. It's not a carte blanche. But where that does come into play, again, is in the fact that Adam actually names his wife. What? I said where, where that idea comes back into play is when Adam is naming, when Adam actually names his wife. Yes. And he called her. Well, when you hear that language, that's the same language as in Genesis 1. Yes. Where God actually, every time he prays something, he calls her something, he names it. But that's an indication of dominion. Whereas, uh, You're such a chauvinist. <laughs> <laughs> Patriarch. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, it doesn't fly in my house. It's uh, <laughs> in my house. But it's a good <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, and that's... Uh, I'm sure that aspect will be elaborated on by... Whoever is talking about the spousal body, uh, and we we will get to that in the next the section after the next section where, where it says two bodies, one flesh. Uh, but certainly, yes. Thank you uh, for those points. So um, so there's uh, a little bit about the image of God from. Uh, all those people are listed. Uh, so you can speculate uh, to your heart's uh, content about uh, what all that means exactly. Uh, so now, uh, continuing on, uh, so sort of moving then from, uh, from Genesis 1 uh, to the sort of more, uh, more detailed uh, description of creation of uh, specifically man and woman in Genesis 2. Uh, it, it gets into a, a, a more, it, Moses elaborates more uh, about uh, God's work within the creation of man and woman, right? And this always, this freaks people out. Uh, why are there like two different creation accounts and all this sort of stuff? Uh, everybody gets up in arms <coughs> over this. This is one of like the big, like one of the things text critics and people get freaked out about. Uh, that you don't need to. Uh, these two accounts are not uh, in opposition to one another. Uh, one is the broad view of all the days. One is the narrow view of, all right, now we're zooming in on this particular day, right? And I feel like uh, that's so obvious. It seems to be, but if you're, trying to, washed, so. if you're trying to pick hairs and uh, poke holes and stuff, you grasp it whatever you can, right? Yeah, the, the JEDP stuff was just yeah, there you go. crazy. Uh, yeah. When you actually think about it, because authors write their books, and so even like Tom Clancy, when he was alive, toward the end of his life, he had a corporation writing the, the book for him. Yeah. But he's actually the author, and he's the one who actually writes the book and brings it to publication. He has secretaries and other people doing research for him. The whole idea that a community writes this thing, and then these people just carte blanche say, oh yeah, it was Moses. <coughs> who wrote it for thousands of years, and they don't even, that with, without referencing the fact that there were four or five different groups of people writing these various passages in here. It's, it's, it, the, the hypothesis is 
ludicrous on its face. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like with all these things, the alternative uh, that, that these different sort of uh, groups, the alternative theories that these different groups put, put out are, are either just as uh, far-fetched or even more far-fetched than what they're trying to refute. Okay? Like even, even a lot of the evolution, evolutionary theory guys are now saying uh, that, you know, there's some alien beings or crystal god or whatever, right? What is it? Neil deGrasse Tyson has come up with something new now that there's some deity or something that set the, set the world into motion. And mathematicians have uh, a flying spaghetti say monster. That, that there is a, a zero percent possibility that evolution could work. Yeah, right. So, so it's I mean, preposterous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then, uh, with Genesis two, two, is it like now? This is a new story. No, it's not a new story. It's just a uh, elaboration. A more elaborate, elaborating on the previous story. Yeah. It's kind of, it's well, set up in basically the same way as the creation myths of the ancient Near East, where you have kind of like. Uh, where you have like the big story that goes on, well, and then yeah. you have different, then you have a different story that focuses on how people came into existence. Basically. You know, uh, you know Ferris, you know the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. Right? <laughs> so when they're, you know, they're, when they're looking at the the picture, I think it's called Saturday in the Park or whatever, right? The, Sunday in the Park. Sunday in the Park. Yeah. yeah. Heathens. I call it Saturday in the park. <laughs> right? They, that's this, like, I forget what it's Pointalism. called. Pointalism. Pointalism. There you go. Fancy pants. <laughs> right? They start in, they're like just staring at it, and then it goes closer and closer and closer and closer to when you just see the dots. Right? That's, you know, here, chapter one is the big picture view. Chapter two is you're like nose to nose with the painting. Okay? That this is putting you nose to nose uh, with day six, right? Of how it went, how it went down, what happened. Um, so we don't have time to read all of this and still do all of this. So you'll just have to go off your memory of what uh, chapter two says. Uh, essentially that he, uh, you know, uh, brings all the animals before Adam and there wasn't a helper fit for him. Adam names all of them and then uh, he causes Adam to fall into a deep sleep. Does the first surgery, takes one of Adam's ribs out. That's how you know Adam wasn't a black guy. <laughs> you got to edit that part out probably. Uh, and, then, uh, and then fashions Eve from the rib of Adam. Uh, that Kleinig says here God is depicted in down-to-earth, hands-on terms as a potter or a sculptor who forms the man and the animals from the soil, that's 2, 7, and 19, and as a builder who constructs the woman from the rib of the man, that's uh, 2, 22. Right. Uh, that God is active in a different way with the creation of uh, of the animals and especially of man. Okay? That he's a kid down in the dirt making mud pies. He's physically involved in the creative aspect, uh, especially of man. That he forms man from the dirt uh, and breathes uh, in his nostrils the breath of life. Okay? Just as you all uh, hopefully were reminded of this back on Ash Wednesday. I remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Everybody washed all their crosses off, I see. I always think it'd be fun to just get a Sharpie and tattoo. <laughs> Make it count, so you forget to get it to last. But anyhow, what? It's ash. Yeah, I know. Ash of the sacrifice. Do like an ash Sharpie or something. I got paint pens. Could you? Super glue. And maybe you could go on Shark Tank and you could 
No, that's the that's defiling the human created body. That's for somebody else to talk about. Uh, so he uh, uh, continues, like the animals, human bodies come from the dust of the ground and return to the dust when they die. Yet, unlike the animals, whose bodies are indirectly animated by God, they, human bodies, are directly animated, animated by God who breathes the breath of life into Adam's... And it's, that's not a typo, it said mouths, and I'm not sure why he said Adam's mouths. Uh, and lungs, uh, that's, that supernatural uh, intervention makes Adam and his descendants spiritual beings who have been created in God's image. Right? And this isn't just for Adam, this continues on uh, to all of Adam's progeny. Right? Uh, just as uh, verse 4 of chapter 2, these are the generations. Right? This is not just a one-off, one-shot deal. This is uh, setting in motion what is continually uh, to be. Right? This is how, uh, how it is uh, supposed to continue on. And as God uh, created everything, whether it's uh, man or animals or the plants and the trees, all these things, everything had uh, seeds according to its kind and so on and so forth, uh, so that his creation would... Uh, continue to be. Uh, that this uh, goes through all the generations. So also, uh, man came from the ground. He was also to get his sustenance from the ground that God caused every tree and plant to yield fruit and vegetation uh, to feed man and the rest of creation. Right? And then of course, so I throw in the caveat there in case it wasn't obvious that Adam and Eve at first were vegetarians, right? The, the first created man before the fall was a vegetarian. I don't advocate for this now, in no way, shape, or form. Uh, sure the but, chili cook-off later today. Yeah, the chili cook-off, yeah. Uh, but, but this is how it was in the beginning. And that's not speculation, that's just the reality. Uh, so, so that's a little bit of, a, of the gist of uh, what that was like. And now then, uh, to get deeper then, this is what we see within, uh, within chapter 2. There's, uh, of course, more detail then of uh, the creation of Adam, but also the creation of Eve. Uh, that Eve was created in a way uh, that was different from Adam and different from everything else. Uh, that uh, Here we see that in his creating, God also provided means for his creation to continue through procreation. Every plant, plant and tree produced seed, and the animals were capable of reproducing. So also is the case with man after the creation of woman. Since none of the other animals were a fit match for him, God made uh, Eve from Adam's rib. Kleinick says, by doing that, God does not clone Adam or in order to replicate him, nor does he, as some suppose, create a male and female from a hermaphrodite, a single asexual or bisexual primordial human being. Rather, by creating Eve from Adam's ribcage, the Lord God <coughs> creates a strong physical affinity between them with the urge to reconnect physically once again. He does not make her from Adam's head so that she would dominate him, nor from his feet so that he would oppress her, but from his side so that she would be next to his heart. And everybody like says, Aww. Aww. I love those yes. balls. <laughs> uh, so uh, here we have uh, the first marriage and the literal one flesh union. Right? Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Uh, that uh, this uh, is how God uh, created this to be, that here we see uh, the institution of uh, marriage, man and wife, is from the very beginning, even before the fall, uh, that God set this into being. Uh, so then, um, here is a uh, quotation from uh, Pless again, from the Catechism on Human Life. 
God's creation of humanity as male and female is foundational. That is why Luther notes in the large catechism that God wishes us to honor marriage. He has established it before all others as the first of all institutions and created men and women differently, as is evident, not for indecency, but to be true to each other, to be fruitful, to beget children, and to nurture them, and to bring them up in bring them up to the glory of God. We are not just persons, but male and female created for life with God and one another, according to the design that he has set in creation itself. We have human identity as male and female. The very structure of humanity is heterosexual in nature. Life itself is disordered and finally rendered <coughs> impossible when this structure is denied. It's impossible. Uh, you can't have two men and reproduce. You can't have two women and reproduce. Uh, no matter what society tries to tell you, uh, if two women have a baby, there was some sperm coming from somewhere. There was not either of those two women. Okay? Uh, that's how that works. You're going to get canceled for that. <laughs> You mean to tell time. me that the alternative nativity in Hartsville at the Presbyterian Church is wrong? They have an alternative nativity. They have an nativity. alternative nativity at the Presbyterian Church yeah. in Hartsville. Do they also confess the Sparkle Creed? I have no idea. I'm sure if they heard I was going to say if they don't, they probably I just should. know that was one of the reasons why I turned down a job at a Presbyterian home. Yeah. That, to take that to that church. Yeah. yeah, that wasn't going to work. That company corrupts good morals. Uh, so this is, uh, from the very beginning, this is foundational. Uh, the creation of man and woman as two distinctly different uh, beings. Uh, so these are not interchangeable. Uh, you can't uh, switch back and forth. Uh, this is not up for debate, uh, no matter how, how many times you say, man, I feel like a woman, it doesn't make it so. Um, of course, uh, on this side of the fall, there certainly uh, are issues within uh, the human body, uh, but I'll let uh, Pastor Olson deal with that next month. So there you go. If, if I hadn't put in enough plugs... Come back next month and hear Pastor Olson. He gets to talk about all the good stuff of all the mess ups. Are you going to say Pastor Olson everything that you told him over the whole stuff of Since he's not here today? Yeah. Nice. I'm sure he'll do it. He's so good, he'll do it uh, naturally, I'm sure. Uh, so, of course, you know, it, you guys can see how this applies to our current society with our. Uh, struggling and discerning between male and female, uh, our lack of understanding of uh, the marital union and the purpose of the marital union, uh, and all those other things. Okay. Uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. How many genders are there? Two. Two. All right. Nine hundred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, also, uh, also chapter 2, also chapter 2 ends uh, that Moses makes sure to let everybody know that they were naked. Alright, they were naked, but they were not ashamed. Alright, so they weren't, uh, they weren't naked in the way that we're naked when you go streaking uh, through the football field or through the quad into the gymnasium. Uh, they, they were naked. Uh, though it may seem minor, it's worth noting the stark contrast to how our bodies are treated now and also what our bodies are able to endure. I never considered this, that uh, with their nakedness also meant that their bodies, you know, along with having the eyes of an eagle uh, and the strength of a lion, uh, also apparently Adam and Eve did not get cold, right? 
Can you imagine a time when a woman didn't need a sweater? <laughs> right? Uh, before the fall, you wouldn't need a sweater. You wouldn't get the chills. Uh, like, I, 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 that's not something I'd really considered, uh, but uh, Luther makes a fine remark about this. He says, it would have been something glorious for a man that though all the animals needed hair, feathers, and scales to cover up their ugliness, he alone was he alone was created with such prestige and beauty of body that he could walk about with a hairless naked skin. Uh, and so we see, you know, this is for you, Pastor Ware, that the beauty of your head uh, is so glorious that it does not in any shape or form need to be covered with hair. Right? Uh, that my, uh, my grandpa, who was bald, he always said that uh, God made a few perfect heads and on the rest, he put hair. Yeah. Is that apply equally to chins? Sir? Does it apply equally to chins? Sure, if you want it to. There's a lot of covering up going on up there. <laughs> uh, the, I, one of my prisoners told me the less of my face that is shown, the better it is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, there might be a biblical basis for this, uh, you know, with the description uh, of eternal life is the sun shall not. The sun shall not strike any, them nor any, any scorching, scorching heat. heat. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. But they also are, are clothed in white robes. Uh, I guess it's. A, I guess maybe you can debate if that's literal or uh, figurative language. Maybe everybody's just naked and unashamed. I don't know. But it's uh, interesting, and of course, uh, as Pastor Olson, I'm sure, will discuss about uh, how our naked bodies have to be clothed now uh, because of our sin and lustful desires and. All of those sorts of things. Yeah. There's pre pre flood, uh, supposedly pre flood. Mm -hmm. It didn't rain. Um, you know the earth yes. was protected. It had um, you no know, dew. It was a constant rain, seventy constant degrees. Constant temperature, they and then after the flood, turn the knob and took it off. If they were naked, it was probably a little more than seventy. Right. I think so. I don't know. Yeah, it was a, what was it? What was the perfect temperature? Like that's up for debate. I don't spend a lot of my uh, spend a lot of time naked, so I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure how I'd feel about what I would want the temperature to be. <laughs> but uh, I mean, this is how perfect uh, God's creation was uh, that there was no need for any of these things. Uh, that with the fall now we have uh, all these things that come into play. That Pastor Olson will talk about next month. Uh, also then lastly, uh, this wasn't really a, uh, a section of the book that I wanted to work this in because I thought this quote was nice. Uh, that uh, humans and their bodies are important because they are God's creation, uh, originally created in His image while Secular society may define or calculate worth in a myriad of different ways. For us Christians, we recognize worth as coming from our Creator. Uh, that uh, in the Catechism on Human Life, uh, Professor Pless says, Christians, however, value human beings uh, and care for them in, in every season of life from conception to natural death not because they possess certain physical or mental traits or cap capacities, but because they are created by God and endowed with life. This worth is not based on what we have or even who we are, but whose we are. Human beings created and redeemed in body and soul by the triune God. Dignity is not a value that we assign to life according to our own estimations of worth. Dignity comes from outside of ourselves, from the Creator, without any merit or worthiness in us. Thus says uh, Professor Fletch. Uh, so here, 
uh, from all of these things, we see the value uh, of human life. And then, uh, in uh, sort of in closing, because uh, I wasn't sure how much time this was going to take or how much we were going to need, uh, I included here uh, some pertinent Bible passages, as I uh, pointed out, and as somebody over there pointed out earlier, uh, it's constant throughout the Bible uh, that God is referred to as our maker and creator. It's all over the place. I tried Googling it and come up with a huge long list that I just did not care to count. Uh, all the mentions, uh, that it's all over the place, uh, and it is constant. Uh, throughout Scripture that uh, God is referred to as the Creator. As I pointed out in the beginning, this is uh, half of all of His work is creation. Uh, and, uh, and so this is not... It, you can't just say that this is... Uh, that this idea is only pertinent to the first two chapters of Genesis uh, and is not throughout all of... Scripture. This is throughout all of Scripture that God is the creator of everything. Uh, and so, uh, even if you take out those first two chapters of Genesis, you still got to contend with all the other mentions of God as creator. Uh, so, uh, you're going to end up with a, uh, like a Jeffersonian sort of Bible or something if you're trying to take that out. Uh, so, I have some of the passages listed there and uh, the... Uh, Previous mentioned Genesis 9 is on there uh, with the shedding of man's blood, uh, which of course then uh, affects uh, how we view uh, murder, right? Uh, and then uh, Exodus 20 uh, lists again the six days of creation, right? So this is not, as I said, this isn't just a Genesis 1 and 2 thing. This is discussed uh, elsewhere. Uh, in scriptures, also First uh, Chronicles 16, 26, uh, and I threw in there Psalm 96, 5. They both say uh, essentially the same thing, that uh, God is the true creator and all other gods are simply idols. Right? They are created things rather than the creator. Uh, and then Job uh, had quite a lot to say about creation. Uh, that everything is in God's hand, that he fashioned us from the womb, uh, that all are the work of his hands. Uh, and then uh, I especially like Job 38, where God puts Job in his place and says, were you there when I created all these things? Uh, like he's, you know, sort of calls him to the rug and uh, tells him he better uh, reassess uh, his uh, status uh, and recognize that he's the creation not the creator, uh, that he wasn't even there uh, when God caused all these things to be. And then, uh, of course, it's all throughout the Psalms. I picked a few of my favorites. Uh, the Psalm 33, the Lord spoke everything into being. Uh, and that uh, Psalm 95, the Lord is our maker. Uh, and Psalm 136, that everything was created in love. Uh, and of course, uh, Psalm 139, that we are knitted together in the womb and we are fearfully and wonderfully made, right? Not fearfully and wonderfully evolved or uh, whatever else people want to say. Uh, also then, uh, Hosea, as uh, Hosea is sort of uh, calling uh, the people of Israel to task, uh, says that they have forgotten uh, their maker. Right? Uh, which is sort of what we alluded to. If you forget that uh, God is your creator, then everything goes off the rails from there. Uh, and then uh, this isn't just an Old Testament idea. Uh, this is also in the New Testament. Uh, I think we alluded to this earlier, uh, both in Matthew 19 and in Mark 10. Uh, these are uh, the accounts of Jesus addressing divorce. Right, where he said, where Jesus uh, quotes Genesis 2:24, uh, that they'll leave their father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Okay. Uh, and also my favorite, John 1, uh, the Word, uh, and then uh, Paul uh, in Acts 17 uh, 
See, seeing all the other uh, gods there in the Aragopolis um, uh, tells them that, that God is the one who created everything, right? Uh, that it's all about uh, the true God who's the creator of everything. And then uh, Romans 1, 18 to 25, that God reveals himself uh, as the creator, that we look at all of creation and we uh, recognize uh, God as the creator of all of these things. And then, uh, and then lastly, I uh, <coughs> sort of scratched together a list there of at least some of the issues uh, that are pertinent uh, and that are uh, affected by our understanding of God as the creator. Uh, I'm sure you guys will come up with more. Uh, but, of course, first and foremost, our submission to a creator uh, that we uh, recognize God is the creator, uh, we are the creation, uh, rather than uh, uh, all of Israel doing what's right in their own eyes. Uh, also then, how we interact with one another, that we see value in one another as, uh, as they are a creation of God just the same as you are. Um, and that goes along with how we value others. Uh, and then that goes to the life issues of murder, abortion, euthanasia, and then the beginning and ending of life, right? These are uh, some major hot issues today. Uh, also then male and female headship and gender roles. Uh, then all of these are understood uh, with the foundation of creation and God's created order. Uh, of man and woman, how woman was created from man, uh, how God is a God of order, uh, and sets these things to be how they're supposed to be. Uh, Kleinig, he's got another, um, he has another, uh, not a book, it's like a big treatise on uh, headship and men and women. What's it called? I forget the name of it. It's really good. If, 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 uh, I can't think of it right now. It's all about headship and uh, submission and uh, what that uh, what that's supposed to look like according to God's created order. Uh, and talks about the uh, how God creates the, this hierarchy for the transmission of blessings, right? Of of how blessings flow from uh, from one to the other uh, through this order that God creates. Uh, also then marriage and sex, right, we uh, are changing the definitions of marriage uh, and making a mockery of the whole ordeal uh, that we just uh, define things however we want to define them to fit whatever we want them to be. Also racism, right, which is uh, a hot button issue these days uh, that uh, this affects our understanding, which is it's completely ridiculous to me that the uh, the uh, sort of liberal uh, side of side of our country or the world really that's all about sort of wokeism and pushing this this idea uh, also hold such an arcane view that uh, that we are <laughs> they they sort of hold this view but then at the same time hold the view that uh, uh, that we're all evolved. Uh, and, and really have this sort of uh, genetic superiority, uh, which is you know similar to Hitler and all that stuff, that uh, if you hold the view that we are all evolved, and of course by necessity some are more evolved than others, so then should, shouldn't you believe in racism then if that's, that there's a difference between the, the, the races? Uh, but if, if you're a Christian and believe Genesis 1 and 2, then you believe there's no such thing as race in the first place. Uh, that all are uh, created by God and descended from Adam and Eve, uh, and so then it's uh, simply a uh, distinction in genetics between uh, some having different traits than others, uh, whether it's skin color, hair color, uh, eye color, whatever. Uh, and so uh, if you're a Christian, uh, you're not going to be racist because you recognize that God uh, created all people, and these things are not congruent. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, also, of course, then care for the planet. Uh, not because you're some hippy-dippy tree lover, uh, but because you recognize that God created all of these things 
uh, and we are to be responsible stewards of God's creation. Uh, not because we think the world's going to end and we're going to cause our own destruction, uh, or because we have to find our value in that, uh, but simply because we recognize the value in this because God created this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the the aspect of care for the planet really fits well with the be fruitful and multiply, right? That if you yes. have those who are coming after you, that that you want also to take care of the planet for their sake, and you're not sort of living as an autonomous island unto yourself. Yes. Um, but but they're after those who come after you who are going to have to live with the decisions that you make. Yes. Yes. I, I dovetailing in there. It's, it's, it's I love a good dovetail. Uh, yes, uh, I used to do that for a living. Anyway, um, <laughs> I was a cabinet maker. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the notion that God, that we're created in the image and likeness of God, and that all human beings are uh, have worth because we are created. Um, it, it's interesting that the, that the um, kind of zeitgeist of the, of, you know, I, I don't like to say the left, I don't know, but these people who, are, who actually believe that they're the, the um, um, world would be better off without human beings. And in fact, it's human beings are, dominion does not mean that you destroy the earth, it means that you take care of it, you cherish it, you, you, um, you cultivate it, you, you make it you make it um, a, a, a beautiful and, and uh, you care for it. It's like hunters are some of the best conservationists. Yeah, right? exactly. And, and then also it's uh, the be fruitful and multiply. It's an amazing thing. I was talking with someone recently. I said uh, that she should have more babies. And, and uh, one of the things coming back was this, this idea from friends, not from her, but that, um, that there are too many people already. I'm thinking, what, what are you talking about? We live in the United States, we have a negative growth rate right now, except for illegal immigration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are too many people. We're not having enough people, and it's yeah. going to become a real problem, like it, like it is becoming in China now, because all of their, their uh, one-child... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Even in places where there aren't. I heard a story this week that uh, South Korea is on the, is like on the break of extinction that they're not going to be people in South Korea because there's so few uh, and so few children. Yeah, in Japan, yeah. it's like it's, it's all it's, it's a it's a ludicrous thing when God says be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, there's a whole uh, oh what's the there's a term for this like the populist or whatever like uh, uh, Bill Gates and yeah. those that think that I forget what the what the term is of like that there's going to be an overpopulation of the world. That's awesome. They've been saying that for no. 50 years. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I've been around that long. So. Well, I have. I'll I've take been. your word for it. Are you talking Malthus? Malthusian? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's sure. But and so, and then lastly, uh, even from something as basic uh, as how we order our days. Right? That we have seven days in a week because there were seven days of creation. The, uh, after the French Revolution. All the French again. Here we go. <laughs> after the French Revolution, I, at least during the French Revolution, they succeeded in turning the calendar around into a ten-day week. Viva la France! <laughs> and they probably did well, that probably was just so they had like a five-day weekend no, or something. They, 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 I think they tried to do it. It's not today. I believe it, of course. That was a long time for people to be Why not? Yeah, and it, I, I, it, yeah, it, 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 Yes. Oh, come on. Well, I mean, it specifically dethroned the sacred view of time, where yeah. every day in the church calendar, like, it was all centered around Christ's time, right? Yeah. And so they were... Even these heathens, to, uh, uh, even the these heathens but still, uh, for six years. still are working <laughs> with, uh, with a, a biblical the calendar. And then they killed all the priests and pastors. <laughs> yeah, no. Leave them the fronts! As a French woman, I take it on. That is...
third and four. There you go. And I'm out of coffee and out of time, so come next month and hear Pastor Olson uh, talk about all the stuff that we messed up. You were too scared up. to talk about? All the stuff. I told you I'm going to stay in my lane and talk about the good positive things and the way God created us. And now Pastor Olson can uh, talk next month about how we screwed it all up. We could have had the eyes of an eagle and the strength of a lion, but we blew it. There you go. All right. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.